what we did last week is we looked at the first word, God. This week, we're going to move on to the next milestone and talk about communication. You see, the very first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so we talked about God creating the heavens and the earth. Wow. Thank you, Jenny. And so as you move a little bit further along, what you find the next thing is that it says, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so the milestone that we're going to look at this week is the word communicates. God communicates. Say that. God communicates. See, God does not remain silent. God does not hide from us. God does not wind up creation, get it all going according to the uh, natural laws that God puts into place, and then leave us all alone. God does not leave us stranded. God does not leave us feeling lonely or alone. God communicates, and I praise God that God communicates so that we know where God is and what it is that God is doing. From the very earliest picture that we see of God, we see God communicating with people in a very personal way. Think about this ideal picture, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He creates the garden, he places Adam in it, and, it, and the scriptures tell us that the Lord God commanded Adam, the man, saying, you may eat from all of the trees, any of the trees in the garden, except for the tree in the middle of the garden, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you, do not eat, if you uh, eat of it, you will surely die. Now, we oftentimes focus on the fact that that is the forbidden tree with the forbidden fruit, and don't eat that, and then we focus on the fact that they ate the forbidden fruit, and, and that's fine, that is a part of the story. But what I want you to see here is that God communicates more than just don't. God communicates do. Okay, You may eat from any of the trees in the garden. First of all, I want you to imagine being Adam. God comes along and says, you may eat from any of the trees in, in the garden. And Adam goes, okay, what's eat? What does eat mean? At which point God needs to communicate, well, okay, there will be a point at which your stomach has this sort of rumbling sound and you feel like there is something wrong in your body. And what it's doing is it's telling you that you need to put food in your mouth so that it will go down into your stomach and that will provide energy for you to live. At which point Adam would probably be going, okay, where's my stomach again? And, and what is a mouth? Okay. See, we skip over all of that stuff because we focus in on the part about the eating of the forbidden fruit, and that's fine. But what I want us to see is that God designed our bodies so that we need food to eat. God explained to Adam that eating is good, that is the way you are designed to live, and all of this is available to you for food so that you may eat it. And so we see it right away in the story in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. God communicates. Say it. God communicates. Okay. And so we see it with Adam. Now, of course, Adam and Eve, they don't listen. They eat the forbidden fruit. They get kicked out of the garden. They end up having children. Oh, well, God communicated that too. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So... They had children, they were fruitful, they started to multiply, their boys grew up, we know the story, Cain and Abel, and Abel ends up giving a, an offering to God which is uh, seen as good in God's eyes, Cain gives an offering to God that is seen as bad in God's eyes, and Cain gets jealous of his brother Abel. You know the rest of the story, he says, hey Abel, let's go out into the fields and have a little discussion. Uh, that wasn't a discussion that they had. So he goes out into the fields, and, and that's it. God uh, sees that Cain murders his brother Abel, but not before God communicates. See, God goes to Cain and tells him, Hey, 
you know, sin is crouching at the door. It, it, is, it is trying to, to get into your life. Don't listen to that voice. Before Cain went and rebelled against God, God communicated directly with Cain to warn him of the consequences of his actions. And Cain still chose those actions. You see, the Lord God said to Cain. And what we find is in the early stories of Scripture, God communicates directly. God said to Noah. The Lord said to Abram, who became Abraham. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said. The Lord said to Jacob. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord called out to Moses, this is at the burning bush, and said. You can look these up in your Bible, you can find the stories, and what you're going to find is in all of these early stories, God communicates directly with those individuals that, and tells them what it is that God wants from them, warns them about things that are going to be hurtful to them, and tells them the beautiful picture, the design that God has for their lives. When we get to the days of Moses, what happens is people start to get frightened of drawing near to God. You know the story of the burning bush. We know that Moses goes in and talks to Pharaoh. Pharaoh ends up uh, saying, no, I'm not going to let the God's people free. We have the ten plagues that all come down the pike, and each one of them gets Pharaoh more frustrated, more angry, and finally he releases the Israelites only to change his mind. He goes after them with an army, and God protects them with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. God tells Moses to turn around and hold up his staff, and then the Red Sea parts, and they walk through on dry ground with water like walls on either side of them. They get to the other side. Pharaoh's army tries to come after them, and the water crashes down on top of them, and finally God's people, the Israelites, are set free. They praise God and sing uh, the song of Miriam at that time. And they go on to Mount Sinai to worship God, the mountain where Moses first encountered God at the burning bush. But when they get there, they are told not to go up on the mountain because it would be too frightening, too terrifying to draw near to God in that way. But God would speak to them from the mountain. And sure enough, God did. There was all kinds of rumbling and fire and, and a cloud coming down on the top of, of the mountain. And the people were so terrified of that that they, they were afraid not only of drawing near to God, they were afraid of even hearing from God. And it was at that point that the people perceived the thunder, the lightning, the flashes of sound, the, of trumpets, the mountain smoking, and the people saw it. They trembled, they stood at a distance, and they said to Moses, You speak to us yourself. We will listen to what you have to say. Don't let God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid. God, God's come in this way in order to test you, so that the fear of Him may remain in you, so that you will not sin, so that you'll live out God's design for your life. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was, and then Moses would bring back the message like the Ten Commandments. That was the end of the era where God spoke to people personally, directly. From that point on, what we see is that God starts to communicate through a mouthpiece, a spokesperson, or the biblical word for that is prophet. At that point, Moses was functioning as the first prophet, a, spokesper a spokesperson for God. God gave the message to Moses. Moses gave the message to the rest of the Israelite people. Every prophet that we find in the Bible, in the pages of Scripture, functioned in the same way. They received message or messages from God. God told that prophet to go and deliver the message to a person or a group of people. And if it was a good prophet, they delivered exactly the message that God gave them to exactly the person or group of people that God told them to go to. Sometimes they went willingly. Sometimes they fought against God and it did not go well for them. And so they ended up in the belly of a fish for three days, for example. When Moses was ready to die, he told the people, 
that prophets would come after him. And he says, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder spoken takes place, and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods that you have not known, and let us worship them then you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. What we were told then is that there would be such a thing as a true prophet and there would be such a thing as a false prophet. Every person who comes along and says, I have a word from God to share with you, is not a true prophet that actually has a word from God to share with us. And so there are a couple of tests. One is that a prophet would always have some sort of a sign, a wonder, or a miracle of some sort. Maybe even a short-term prediction of something that is far outside of the natural order of things. Like the sun is going to stop in the sky for three hours. Or uh, uh, you know, they, uh, the axe head is going to float on the top of the water. And so a a prophet, a true prophet, one, would always have a sign, a wonder, a miracle to confirm that they are speaking for the living God. God said that this would be the case so that we can start to weed out the liars, the false ones, okay? The second thing, though, God says, is that they will always point you back to the one true God, the God who has been revealed by other prophets up to this point in time. And so uh, if they try to take you in another direction or away from the God that has already been revealed to you, do not listen to them. And then here's the key. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love Him with all of your heart and all of your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow. It is Him that you must revere. Keep His commands, obey Him, serve Him, hold on to or hold fast to Him. The prophets did come. There were many true prophets that happened since, that came around since the days of Moses. Moses walked the face of the earth, oh, in the ballpark of 1500 B.C., And after him would be prophet after prophet after prophet who would pass these tests of true prophecy. They would write down their prophecies or they would write down the story of the prophet and his interaction with God and what it is that that prophet or prophetess did and said. And those writings then started to get gathered together. In the beginning with Moses... There were only five books worth of writings. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, that, those five books have a special name, the Torah or the Pentateuch. And those five books are attributed to Moses, 1500 B.C., as writing those down. The books that we have in, in here that come after that got built over time. As the Israelites lived out their walk with God or not walking with God, and as God sent prophets and messengers to them, it kept getting added to and added to and added to. When we get to the days of what we call the New Testament, which is starting with the birth of Jesus, what you're going to find is that Jesus himself passes the tests of prophecy, and not only Jesus, But his disciples, his followers, also were empowered by the same Holy Spirit, had miraculous signs, and when they were writing down their writings, they knew that they were acting as a prophet, giving a message from God to an audience, to a group of people. Peter said this, the apostle, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, even though they were human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is is the one who would give the words to these prophets. And Peter spoke of them and said that even though they were human beings, what they were doing, they were human beings who were reporting what God told them to say. 
Paul said this to the, to the Roman church. The Jews were entrusted with the very words of God or the oracles of God. Paul and Peter, these New Testament uh, people, recognized that the prophets of old were speaking on behalf of God, and that's why this book sometimes gets referred to as God's Word, and you hear people talking about it that way. The book I'm holding in my hand is the Bible, and it was written over the course of 16, 1700, maybe 1800 years, depending on uh, who you talk to and, and uh, what, what scholar is diving into the details on this. And so you have a book that was written over, over a thousand years, 1,500 years, you know, many hundreds of years, uh, and it is written by over 30 different human authors. Yet when you read it, you find that it holds together with such continuity is to make you realize that there's somebody else, there's something else going on behind the scenes that holds this all together. That something else, that someone else is God. God is the one who's speaking through those prophets. God is the one who is speaking to the apostles like Peter, Andrew, James, John, like the apostle Paul. And they recognized that even these New Testament people recognized that they were living as prophets as well. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it, Peter said, as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The Apostle Paul said this to the church in Corinth, this is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. In another place, Paul wrote to his protege Timothy and said, All Scripture is God-breathed. Scripture simply means writings. All of these writings are God-breathed. Uh, the Greek word there... Uh, this is the best translation, God breathed, or maybe you will see it in your Bible to say God inspired or inspired. All of those are translating the same, the same Greek word there. Scripture is God breathed or inspired. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man, the person of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God spoke to people personally in the past, and then when they asked for a prophet, God had them write it down so that God would give us specific information about what it looks like to walk with God and how to draw near to God so that we can walk with God. And so God communicates specifically through the pages of Scripture, or you can call it the Bible, or you can call it God's Word. Now, I know that there are a lot of discussions and confusion about the Bible because we have different translations that are out there. And uh, we end up even with some arguments over whether some books should be included in this or not. And some people, uh, some Christian denominations have a few extra books in there. Okay, What I want you to, to know is simply this. That as this one has less books, it doesn't have those extra books in it. It's not because I'm protesting against anybody or because I'm trying to fight against uh, different parts of the body of Christ. It is simply because this is a subset that everybody agrees upon. And the message and the theology that you're going to get from here is the same as the message or the theology that you would get by having those extra books in there. I've read the extra books. It doesn't give us anything that's not included here. And so we go ahead and just stick with these and get started with these. And this will help us all to see the picture of walking together with God. When it comes to translations, well, I, I don't even get into that, that argument about what translation is, is best. And here's why. Uh, a lot of times we like to fight over uh, in different parts of, of the body of Christ over which translation is right or which one is, is best. But the reality is that all of them are, in fact, translations. You see... Uh, the Bible was not originally written in English. 
the Bible was originally written in Hebrew in the Old Testament and in Greek in the New Testament. Those were the languages of the day at the time that they were written. But most of us do not know Greek and Hebrew. And since we don't know Greek and Hebrew, then we need to resort to getting a translation in a language that we are uh, able to read so that we can get this specific, under, this specific information about God and what it looks like to walk together with God. When we argue over whether a, a specific English translation is the only correct, right, true, authorized translation, what we're forgetting is that English is only one language. And so we fight over it and say, this is the only true Bible. And it's in English. But what about people who speak Spanish? Or German? Japanese? Chinese? Farsi? So they can't get to know what it is that God had to say because they can't read your English translation of the Greek and Hebrew originals? You see, very quickly the whole thing starts to fall apart when we have those kinds of arguments. My suggestion is simply this. Recognize that anything that we have is going to be a translation into the language that we are used to, whatever language we are most comfortable with. And so find a good translation that takes it from the originals, the Greek and the Hebrew, in a language that you can read and understand and then read it. I'm often asked, what is your favorite kind of Bible? Or what is your favorite Bible? And I will tell you, this right here is my favorite Bible. Old, worn, beaten up, and well read. That's my favorite Bible. Get one that you can turn into your old, worn, beaten up, and well read Bible. That's the Bible that is the best Bible for you. And then start diving in. Because God has a lot to say about what it means to walk together with God and what it means to help others to walk together with God. And when we read the scriptures, then we start to recognize where God is pointing us. And if God does communicate to us personally, we start to recognize when it is God's voice and when it is not God's voice. You see, when you read the specific revelation that has been confirmed by God as God breathed, then you start to say things when you, that voice comes into your head. You go, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like God. That sounds like the serpent that's trying to get me to go against God. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound like God. That, that, God already said, don't do that. Don't go there. Don't believe that. Uh, and, it, and God said it over and over again throughout thousands of years. And so I know that that's not God coming into my head. Get away from me. Get out of there. And so we start throwing those thoughts away. This helps us discern the voice of God if we get to the place where we are listening for the voice of God. And so God communicated personally, and now God communicated specifically. But for some of you, I know that you're still struggling and saying, well, Pete, I, you know, I don't know that uh, the Bible, I'm not, I'm not on board with that. The whole Bible being the Word of God, the whole Bible being you know, inspired by God, I, I just, I'm not there yet. Um, okay. Well, then we go back to last week. Do you believe that God created the heavens and the earth? Because if you believe that, if you see that, if you recognize that, then you can learn an awful lot about God just by looking at creation. See, that's why I'm not afraid of science. It's not just because I'm a geek and I love science, which I am and I do. But it is because when I go into scientific study of the world and the universe around me, I see the workmanship, the handiwork of God. And as we dive further into the details, my faith is just strengthened more and more. Because I am overwhelmed by the amazing complexity of the world, of the universe, and how it all holds together in a way so that life as we know it continues to exist and go on from generation to generation, 
just as God said. And so God communicates specifically in the Bible, personally with the people in the past one-on-one, but He communicates to us through creation as well. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. God communicates to us in general through creation. God didn't just wind up all of nature and let it go. God then communicates with us, His creatures, His creation, His handiwork, and especially to us, human beings made in His image. And He tries to reach out to us so that we will know how to live that garden walk, enjoying everything that He has designed for us, walking together with God.